Well, good morning. What a joy to be able to open God's Word with you this morning as we begin a brand new message series. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. As uh, I was writing this series pre-COVID-19, I was really focused on a different kind of a theme. And so then during that COVID thing, I said, you know what? We're going to be coming back together as the body of Christ. And Peter speaks to this about the need to have connection with people. God himself is representative in the Godhead of the Trinity and designed in community. And he encourages us that you are not designed to live life alone. Instead, you are designed to live life in community, in connection with other people. There's in some ways a natural desire within us that, that we connect with people. And sometimes we find ourselves in our lives isolated and we tend to feel a bit of that aloneness. And so maybe in this time of COVID-19, you felt that. You felt like, wow, it's great to be able to be around people again. Maybe others of you are like, well, it's great, but uh, keep your distance, right? (laughs) I still have some boundaries that I want to have out there in my life. But we're going to jump on our core values as a church. A number of years ago, we said, listen, there are all kinds of things that we can be involved in as a church. But what are the core pieces that are unique to the people of, that are gathered in this space. Now, over the years, that has changed some. We've seen some people move on to other ministry opportunities. We've seen people relocate. We found that some people said, well, you know, that's not really fitting for me now. I'm going to go join this other church. That's why we keep a large kingdom mindset here at New Life. We want to be about the kingdom of God and where God is breaking through in the lives of people and even within our community. And we want to partner with that. We want to be excited about what's happening in these other churches and not just New Life Community Church. And so we're grabbing a hold of some of these pieces of what is it about New Life Church, the people that make up New Life Church, and our commitments in ministry here as God has called us. And so we're jumping into the books of uh, 2 Peter as well as um, the book of Jude. And so uh, proclaim person up back Apparently, we didn't check this for me today, and there we go. So be attentive. I might need your help here a little bit. But we're going to pick up out of 2 Peter. Now, last year, the same time, we did 1 Peter. Now, some of you know who Peter was. He was one of Jesus' disciples. He walked along with Jesus. He saw, he witnessed the miracles that Jesus did. And he was very rambunctious. He was very energetic. He was one of these guys who, who just wanted to conquer everything and do it all for Jesus. And let's go, you know. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's go. You know those kind of people? I love those kind of people. This advance the kingdom. But sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves or we can easily get a little bit ahead of God. And so we need to have others around us like Jude. Who's Jude? Well, he's one of the disciples. He's a half brother of Jesus. You don't know much about Jude. He was kind of in the background. You know those kind of people? They're in the background, but they are very effective. And when they speak, you best listen. And so Jude does that. In fact, here's how Jude starts out his book. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. We believe that's James, the brother of Jesus. To those who have been called, who are loved by God, the father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Okay, very standard greeting of the writers of the New Testament. And we see that in 2 Peter, we're going to see a very similarity. So that's why I'm bridging these two books of the Bible together, because they have so many similarities. But here's what's interesting about Jude, because he goes on and he says this. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write about to you the salvation we share. okay, so he's he's ready to write that, but then he changes direction. Watch this. I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that the Lord has once for all entrusted to us, his people. In other words, get ready. 
I've got some things I, I want you to be concerned about. And they can come across as negative. He wants to talk about our joy and, and our salvation and all the pieces of that. But what I instead am compelled to write to you is not going to be so great and encouraging and uplifting. Okay, get ready. And Peter does the same thing. And what's interesting to me, for because it really fits for us today, is those last line there when he says, the Lord has once for all entrusted to us his people. The opportunity, the need to contend for the faith. Lou Koopman, 94 years old, right here, memory of him in trust to us. He sat over here so faithfully. He prayed for you, the church. He championed this ministry again and again. Pastor, how's the church doing? He would often ask me in my visits. Because it was in his heart. It was in his life. He wanted it to advance. He wanted people to come to faith. And he's now gone. And so we, and, and that's been a burden for me to consider. That it's now been entrusted to us. And to us, even in our own children and those generations. So today, we're going to grab a hold of this idea of worship. And so, uh, sorry, I think it worked, but now it's not again. So I'm going to give up this resource if you'll just hang in there with me. Worship, the gift of knowing God. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter. We're going to read the first four verses of the scripture as we grab a hold of this idea of worship. See, that's one of the things about gathering that's necessary and important and God desires in community is that his people worship him together. See, our culture is so individualized. Right now, as I read this scripture, you're going to think about yourself. But I'm challenging you instead to think about the church because that's what Peter's writing to. It's filled with individuals, but he's speaking to more than just individuals. He's saying as a community of faith. Because see, this goes clear back to Israel, clear back to God calling Abraham. I am your God and you are my people, right? God is always speaking into community. But in our individualistic mindset and our culture today, I think we miss it a lot. So here at New Life, we like to stand when God's word is being read as showing its authority in our lives. So I invite you to do that if you're able and willing to do that. We're only reading four verses today. And he begins with Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. As we look at this text, I read a lot of John Piper, pastor and reformed theologian, and I just love how he articulates some things, and so I'm going to be quoting him a couple of times, but the first thing I think he wants us, and God's word, and Simon Peter wants us to capture, is the preciousness of our faith. Don't take it for granted. It is very unique in our culture today. It is very special that you recognize God has spoken to you. And it may sound like a phone call. Thank you, Monty, for that demonstration, right? I mean, God calls us, but so many people ignore the call, right? Some people say, wow, you're really good at dealing with interruptions. <laughs> I try to always make an example of it because... 
When that phone rang, you should have seen everybody's heads. <laughs> so I knew I lost you. And I thought I was making a pretty significant point. Because, see, there's distractions all around you. And as a Christ follower, your goal and Peter's reminder is to distractions, block them out and listen for the voice of God and what he is saying to you and what he is challenging you to. And that's what we're going to hear now. And that's on you, right? That, that's on you. If God is speaking, but you're not hearing, some of it can be because you're not listening or you're not putting yourself in a place to listen. Or maybe you don't like what he's saying. <laughs> right? It's like, I don't hear him. Right? <laughs> but as we grab a hold of this preciousness of faith, Peter says those very words received a faith as precious as ours. Don't take it for granted in the opportunity that you have been given. I like how Peter introduces himself. He says, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, apostle, that's that role of authority. That's that role of power. That's the role that speaks on behalf of God. Do you know people who introduce themselves by their role of authority? Right? You need to listen to me because... But Peter doesn't do that. He could, but instead he says, a servant... In other words, I'm not the authority Jesus is, and I'm following him, and I'm serving him. Even though he has made me an apostle, I come to you not under that authority, but I come to you under the authority of Jesus Christ. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen to the words that God is saying. He humbles himself in front of these people, and he points to the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of God, not your own, not your own merit, not your own efforts, not your own desire, not your own self-righteousness, but instead the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because, see, you're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes you're battling that life of internal desire and passions. But Jesus, he overcame all that. He stood as a life of righteousness and offered up himself for our sake and gives to us that righteousness, that right standing with God. And this is what Peter says to us. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now, he's about to go into some negative stuff. He's about to go into some issues of dealing with false teachers, those that are proclaiming to be of God but speaking falsely and going into the churches and, and causing disruption, going into different areas and telling the people they shouldn't be living. We're going to dive into more of what that is and even how it shows up in our culture today because, believe me, there are false teachers today just as there were in that day that twist the gospel, that try to rearrange it. And so Peter's whole purpose here is that grace and peace be yours in abundance. Not just a, yeah, I know. <laughs> My fellow brother pastor over here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Let's get back to work, you know. And, and, and it's like, yeah, I've got that assurance. Peter is saying, I don't want you just to have your ticket to heaven. I don't want you just to know that you're escaping the flames of hell. I want you to live and breathe and ooze out God's grace and God's peace in your life to others as it's been given to you. And then he says, how do you know about this? By knowing God. That's what's going to bring peace in your life. Is knowing God. Piper says this, next quote. Piper says this, through his righteousness revealed in Jesus Christ, God gives his people a faith that brings grace and peace 
to life. Now these next two verses, Peter builds on this connection between God knowing him and the power of grace. And so the next blank to fill in is the power. His divine power is, gives us everything we need to look for what? For life and godliness. See, that power comes from God for life. This is the goal. This is the direction of that power in your life is that you may exude life and that you may also continue to grow in your relationship with God where you look more like Jesus every day. Do you look more like Jesus today than you did last year? I would hope so. As you're pressing in and, and, and the things of God are more important to you today than they were last year. Or how about last week? Well, that's asking a little much. <laughs> right? But God desires that you conform to the likeness of his son, Jesus, who did what? Put the needs of others ahead of himself. He loved God and he loved people. And our world is desperate for love. Not the twisted, goofy, weird love that the world thinks is love, but instead a love that's divine, a love that comes from outside of ourselves. They're looking for it. They're hungry for it. But where does this source come from in our own life? But from his divine power, not yours. You don't try to be better. I got to do that right. No, let God be at work in your I need to give more space for God to be at work in me. So that that source of divine power shows itself in my life. Now, it doesn't mean you're you're passive. Like, well, God's going to do it. Just doing my life. God's going to do it. You have to put yourself in the position for God to do it. Sometimes that requires you to say no. It requires you to say no. That's on you. What you say yes to and what you say no to... That's on you. That's your part of of the engagement. And you say yes to the things of God and watch out. Here he comes and what he's going to do. See, Christian faith isn't just doctrines to believe. It's not just about what you know or what you want to declare or a certain theological position that you want to take. Peter is saying it's more than knowing, it's doing, it's experiencing. And he's saying it's a resurrection power that's at work in you that enables you and gives you to be conformed more like Christ so that you can love others as Jesus did instead of wanting all my needs met, instead of easily following the natural way of things and wanting just my stuff. So how's that power experienced in our lives well the next slide says that through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness peter is saying it's all about grace that's a that's a that's a great definition of grace right there our knowledge of him who calls us by his own glory and goodness that's that's acknowledgement of god's grace at work in our lives piper has a, a long quote. It's, I don't have it up here for you. But he says this. If we could but see the glory and excellence of God and know that our creator has approached us and said, you there, come. I'm going to show you my glory and give you an eternal life to enjoy it. Piper says it would mean power. The power of hope. And the power of godliness. And you know this from experience when you see the glory and excellence of God most clearly and know he has set his affections on you. Then it is when you have power to live as you ought. There are two things Peter wants us to know. How to be liberated from the power of sin and how to be united to God's likeness. Let's go to the next one. We see the promises. He says there are these very great and precious promises that we have. And the first one is about protection. That we will be delivered from the corruption of this world. See that? Verse 4, and escape the corruption of this world. That means you have choices in life. 
You can follow the paths of the world, like our whole series last week or last uh, month talked about with Proverbs, or follow the ways of God. He empowers you to do that. And then the second thing is the participation. We share in that divine nature. Now, if we want to get theologically deep, we can really go deep here, but I'm not choosing to go that way because there are certain attributes of God that you cannot become. You cannot become uh, everywhere, every place throughout time. That You can't do that. But there are other characteristics of God that he would have you adapt to. And this is what it means by this participation in the divine nature, something outside of yourself. If what we see on the news today, not the positive protesting and acknowledgement of brokenness in our world, not that part, but the violence, the destruction, people who get that mob mentality and for whatever reason a weapon comes out and an officer is shot in the back of the head where does that come from how does that happen if ever there's a sign in our world that people are not designed based or not basically good that's it Instead, it shows us a world that's broken because of evil. Because God designed it all to be good, but it's been interrupted by evil. And evil in a way that displays it in the human heart. That my my need, my drive, my passion, my desire is so consumed by my own viewpoints, my own filters, that I can shoot somebody in the back of the head and call it righteousness. What is wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. Evil and sin. And God comes in and says, I want to save you from all of that. And I want to put you, the church of Christ, on a different path and a different level. I give you the ability to say no to that stuff. And so don't take your faith lightly. How come you're not involved in a mob mentality? Well, some would say the church has been involved in mob mentalities. Well, we won't go through all of that here today. But it's true, right? The church is broken as well. We've called things sin. We've called people evil. We've driven them out. When Christ would open his arms and love them to say no to the sin in their life and yes to the life and godliness that he has, that he empowers through the Holy Spirit and his divine power. That's who we are. People to champion that. That's the heritage we have. That's what we're called to be and to do. Those are the promises that we have. See, God is looking for worshipers. He's looking for worshipers whose lives reflect worship 24-7. Not just Sunday mornings at 9.30. (laughs) But every day. That's why Paul writes this. We're coming up on another slide. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary. Do you see it? You see it in our culture? It's black and white. We see it in our own lives. There's a battle going on. There's there's a desire of my flesh that draws me this way. But the spirit of God is saying, watch out. (laughs) Don't go that way. Instead, let me lead you on a path of life. And so we can be like this. And I've heard it said, well, which one's going to win? Well, the one you feed the most. If it's like two dogs battling inside of you, which is going to win? The one you feed the most. So what are you feeding? What are you flipping through on your phone? Just a second. Right? Our friend is visiting from uh, out of town, and they mentioned that even her dog notices when she's on the phone and interrupts her. Man, isn't that amazing? 
right? What are, you, what are we listening to? What's on your Facebook feed? What if instead we woke up in the morning and said, God, today I'm yours. Whatever you have for me, give me your eyes, Jesus. So just like you saw people when you walked around, And God spoke in your spirit, that one. Go talk to that one. See, some of you sitting here today, brother, are in tune with that, and you have stories to tell. You have stories to tell about how God used you in a moment. What would it be like if our whole church did stuff like that? Right? Like like we just embraced it. Yeah, you've got your stuff you've got to do. But what about in the middle of it, the vet who comes onto your property or the insurance salesman or the seed guy or the soil condition guy or the person at Maverick behind the counter or the, the, the mail carrier or the UPS guy or who, whoever you interact with, there was something there that God wanted to do and he wanted you to be involved in it. He's inviting you to be involved in it. But if you're just like, oh, yeah, my package, great. I can't wait to open it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. God bless. I do that sometimes. I always say the God bless. And yet you might say, well, they just want to come and go. They don't really want to talk. Well, I have found that to be not always true. The point I'm making is you want your life to bring honor and glory to God. And if you make yourself available, he's going to show you. And you're going to be wowed by it. Another quote from John Piper here says, The word, okay, that's wrong. There we go. The word teaches that if we saturate our minds and hearts with the glory and excellence of God in the scriptures, there will be an explosion of worship, love for one another, compassion for the world, and harvest. I see glimpses of that in this space. And so do you. I see little explosions, but I'd love to see it in this space all more consistently and all the time because of what's happening out there that you come in here. Because see, these folks up here are not the presentation. They're not necessarily all that God is looking at. You're the choir, and God is looking at you singing to one. And so they are empowered and encouraging us. They're all fired up. When we walk in the doors, they're already passionate and ready to go. But we're not quite there. We're still scurrying, trying to get our stuff. Got to get our coffee. Get in here, right? But then we, once we're here, we can engage. Or joining online, we, we engage because of what also we've experienced throughout the week where we've seen God at work. And so I'm ready to come in and those words on the screen are not just recitation of mindless nothingness. You engage in it. You make it a point to watch those words and sing them with your heart. That's what our priority is. That's what our core value is. Here is heartfelt worship, not mindlessness conformity. What kind of core value would that be, Todd? We we promote mindless conformity. No. Instead, your own individual heart in corporate worship together as we praise him. See, biblical worship's not just time here when we read or talk about God, but instead out there as well, our words and our actions must be directed to him. Worship honors God. It's directed toward God, and it requires involvement on our part of the worship, as the worshiper. And all of that is only available through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning where we could dive in to what Peter and Jude, who physically saw you, they walked with you. They witnessed it. We just have the, the recordings in your word and the stories, some even outside of your word of tradition and understanding. But thank you for their example as they speak to us and it touches our hearts and it, it touches our minds and causes us to live with your divine power that, that flows into our lives 
so that we may know you more and that we may trust your precious promises. They're great. And this power flowing through these promises, that's what produces lives of godliness. And we know that all of life is marching toward this great crescendo where that great word of you, God will, the Father will till God the Son go and gather the church as we gather together to your glory and honor. But may we today grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us online. And I just want to affirm to you to keep coming back as God's ways work. For those of you who live in this area and you've not been part of a fellowship or you've been a long time, I invite you to come check us out. You will be graciously welcomed in this space while practicing safe social distancing. We want to be concerned about that, and so I'm grateful for our team here. But I invite you now to stand for God's blessing. Usually I end with a passage of scripture and encourage you that as you walk out these doors, you're entering the mission field. But today our worship team is going to lead us in that. And a song called The Blessing. And I invite you to sing along with it. Because God calls us into community. It's not just about the pastor and the pastor's role up front saying, bless you. It's about us together blessing one another as well. So when we sing that blessing, don't just listen to them. <laughs> as great as a the job they're doing, I'm so thankful for you guys. Blessing you. But engage and sing along as we bless each other. Amen. 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 Amen.
upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 Amen. What an amazing blessing. Yes, we can give a shout of praise, right? Let's worship him. As, as we sing that song, I know you guys have heard that song. They're just playing it all over the place, and I love it, right? Jeannie uh, showed me that song, and um, man, just to sit there and meditate on that in the morning, in my wherever I'm at, right? My kids, my kids, kids, and Lord, that, that his favor be upon me. And that we would take that encouragement and that truth and we'd go share the gospel and go, go share the message that we heard today, right? Being the hands and feet of Christ and loving on others. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you guys. So great to see you this morning. Let's go serve our King. Hallelujah. We'll see you next week.